So my first question is, obviously great to have you back on the show. And since the last time we had you on the show, the stock is up and done very, very well, up about 150% since you're on the show. So can you tell us some of the milestones that you guys have hit this year that helped increase the interest in the stock and in your company? Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, the last year is a big year for us. We'd, uh, we put out a plan um, probably about September time, 2023, and really the, the fruits of our labor are coming, uh, coming to roost now. And it's, you know, the first part of it was a new kind of global resource across both projects for the first time and then new metallurgical work and then an updated PEA. So they were kind of three major catalysts. And the first part of that, the resource, I mean, it was it was after the merger of uh, the large project and the ranch project in North, but it's looking at producing a global resource across both projects. That came out in early May. It was about 4.7 million ounces. 4 million of that is was in the measured and indicated category as well. So a ton of confidence in that resource. And then the next part was really metallurgical work. Uh, I got a lot of questions around, you know, how do you take a uh, high sulfidation epithermal gold system and a low sulfidation epithermal gold system and, and do those work together? And the simple answer is yes. And the metallurgical recoveries are fantastic. 95% for gold, 92% for silver. And those have actually come up a long way from the previous metallurgical work that was completed on the lawyers project. And, and part of that is just that the, the new flow sheet that we have is really just kind of complement, um, they, they, they complement each other. Basically we've added in a flotation circuit and that has improved uh, the silver recovery substantially. Um, and then all of that work really fed into a new updated PEA that we put out at the start of September with some phenomenal economics. I mean, the after, so we used 1930 gold, that, that was a three year trail on average as of the end of July and 24 silver. So very conservative numbers and a, a long way down from where we currently sit today, but even at those numbers. The after-tax uh, NPV of 1.3 billion, after-tax IRR of 35%, very, very good. Um, kind of at the very top of our peer group, I'd argue. Um, and I mentioned the the, the gold uh, commodity, gold and silver commodity prices there. But the nice thing about this project is as well. I mean, if you look at spot prices, you know, let's say, in fact, let's say we use 2,500 gold and, and um, 30 silver. I mean, the after-tax numbers um, are, are, are incredible, 2.25 billion and, and kind of 53%, I think it is. But arguably the most important part, I'd say, is that the, the project works under a range of commodity prices, even on the downside. I mean, even if you use something like 1,700 and, and 22 silver, the NPV is still basically right at a billion, uh, the IRRs and the 20, I think it's 29%. So very robust project. Um, the production's up considerably. We're looking at doing about 215,000 ounces a year over a 14 year mine life where the first few years are about 275,000 ounces as well. And that is on the, really driven by a 3 million, just over 3 million mineable ounces that is split between open pit and underground. And, and really that's been part of the game changer here is looking at a combined, open pit underground scenario. The all in sustaining costs are really low on this project as well. We're sitting right around a thousand US dollars an ounce. Uh, the payback is is just about, it's just two years. So it's incredibly quick payback. Um, CapEx is just under 600 million. So we're looking at a two, 2.1 to one NPV to CapEx ratio, which in terms of, I mean, if you look at our peer group, we're right at the top. Um, using some of those metrics, especially of NPV to CapEx. And all of this in my mind is still very much a starting point. I mean, we, we put this plan in place, we've executed on it. You've, we're just shy of 5 million ounces across the project. The economics are fantastic, but there's still a ton of upside that remains here. I mean, the lawyers project is open for growth at depth and, and uh, the ranch project still has a lot of targets. So, you know, not only or we, do we have the ability to grow the ounces that we have, 
but we also have the ability to actually potentially improve the economics, which is pretty rare. So a lot's happened over the last year, and I think that in part, as well as a good, uh, you know, the, what looks to be the start of a very good gold market, has helped uh, drive the share price from uh, the last time we talked in February. Yeah, the gold market has been absolutely phenomenal. Seems like almost every day, except for today, uh, gold's been going up. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 your stock has been responding and, and going up and obviously you guys have been able to raise capital and, and hit a lot of your milestones and congratulations for hitting all of those milestones so far this year and like you said it's just getting started so for investors that are watching all over the world that are part of our community it's a very exciting opportunity now what milestones are you looking to set and achieve going into 2025 so, uh, I mean, I think you're going to see drill results from this, this summer program. We did about 10,000 meters of drilling uh, in the summer, and that was split between two projects, the lawyers and ranch. And it was split about 50-50. Um, on the lawyers project, it was focused on basically converting critical inferred ounces to measured and indicated for the pre-feasibility that we're about to start working on. And ounces that will have a material impact on the economics. And we actually put out drill results from that project this morning, the headline being eight meters of 11 and just, just under 11 and a half grams gold equivalent. So very strong numbers, close to surface. And it, it's not, it's, you know, those are, better than expected and the deeper drilling as well that we were doing targeting some of the underground you know we're heading where we where we expected to define in those um or, or you know essentially verifying the model stopes and upgrading those ounces fantastic uh you're going to see more drill results come out over the coming months as well really as we look towards 2025 we are going to begin the pfs uh which we're targeting completion of at the end of 2025 right now. And we're also going to begin the permit process, so the EIA, and that will commence probably late Q1 next year. So huge milestones for the, the project and the company as we move this forward into 2025. That's really, really exciting. I'm just pulling up your chart here so we can take a look at it. And it's been a huge success story. And if Thesis Gold were to compare itself to competitors in the gold sector, what would you say sets yourself apart? I really like this question because <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of things that really sets thesis apart from our peer group. I mean, in a lot of that, I mean, it's, it's not a thesis related, it's purely project specific, but it's um, location. I mean, we're, we're in a phenomenal jurisdiction in British Columbia, Canada. The project is in North Central British Columbia, and that has a number of advantages. One, it's, it's effectively a brownfield development site, but it's about 300 kilometers inland from coastal British Columbia. So we don't have the kind of rugged coastal topography that you often associate with British Columbia. You know, we have essentially subalpine to alpine plateaus with broad rolling valleys between it. And some of you might be asking, well, why does that matter? Um, it just makes it logistically very simple to operate. I mean, you've got space to build a mine, you've got space for tailings, you've got space for waste rock, you've got um, the opportunity to operate year round, kind of unencumbered by any of the climatic challenges that you get in coastal British Columbia uh, and the topographic challenges. I mean, we don't get 10 meters of snow every year. I think last year uh, through the winter and the in the camp, we had 50 centimeters of snow on the ground. So if you think about trying to operate an open pit, that that is just very feasible. It's very straightforward. As I said, logistically simple. Um, all the infrastructure is effectively in place. You know, we've there's a fantastic road network on the project. Uh, you can you can get to site year round. Um, we've upgraded six bridges over the last a few years they're all future proof for any mining scenario they're rated to 70 plus tons and the last element is really just extending the power line from Sintera Gold's Kamesk Copper Gold Porphyry deposits about 45 kilometers to the south of us extending that up to our project so I mean in terms of infrastructure for British Columbia it's, it's pretty turnkey which is great um, I guess the other thing is that you know we, we have a lot of confidence in the resource I mean of the 3 million mineable ounces that we outlined in the PEA, only 10% of that is inferred, which is pretty unique. And as a result of that, to get to PFS, to get to feasibility study, we don't have to go back in and do a 100,000 meter infill program to get there. And 
the advantage of that is that we just have less dilution going forward, essentially. I mean, we, we don't have to raise 20 to $50 million to go do that work. In addition to that, the project is actually quite a bit more advanced than the kind of PEA label that it has. In terms of the baseline work, it's it's actually complete on the wires project at Ranch. It'll be about 90% complete by the end of this year. The engineering work is complete to feasibility level across both projects as well. And, and really why I mentioned that, I guess, is that it, it essentially serves the same purpose as the, the infill um, comment that all of these major capital intensive elements of advancing the project to feasibility level are effectively behind us. You know, we're we're looking at uh, desktop studies to continue advancing it here. Now, the other thing is that, I mean, if you look at the the project economics, it, I mean, it, as we just went through, the economics are fa fantastic. If you look at capital intensity per ounce, we're, we, we kind of, we're at the very top of our peer group. If you look at NPV to CapEx, same thing. If you look at after tax IR, same thing again. Um, and the project is really just, it, it still has a lot of upside there to continue improving. So I think that a combination of all of those things is really what set us apart from our peer group. Now you guys had a oversubscribed $21 million funding in June. What do you guys plan to do to continue to attract more retail and institutional investors? Yeah, thanks, Rich. I mean, the the actually that financing that we completed, I got a couple. I've had a couple of questions recently about that, and uh, the financing um, became free trade and uh, just just recently, and questions about you know, you know, are we going to see a lot of liquidity from that financing? And, and no, uh, there is a simple answer. I mean, the the shareholders we're very selective about who we bring into these finances, and we we currently have a fantastic shareholder base uh with that is major, the majority of which is made up of long institutional funds that probably account for about 65 percent of our shareholder base and they're very supportive and as a result i, I mean i don't think we're not really going to see any of that stuff come back out onto the market and then in terms of how we're going to continue to grow our shareholder base i mean a, a lot of that comes down to myself selling the story getting out marketing connecting with institutions and retail shareholders and audiences and i've been basically on the road for the last let's say six weeks and as we get to november as well i leave in about a week and a half and i'm going to be through europe as well marketing so a combination again yeah a combination of conferences networking visiting family offices institutional accounts retail conferences so i think all of that really puts thesis on the map certainly gets a broader reach into those various shareholder bases. 100%. The more you get out there and you tell your story, especially in places like Europe, where we got Frankfurt, uh, where there's a lot of investors in, in Germany, the more potential buyers, the more potential interest, the more potential institutions that want to take a position, the better for the stock, the better for the company, and better for investors. So congratulations on all your success. And I'm excited to see what's going to happen as you go on these roadshows. Now, if there was one thing that you would want shareholders to know about Thesis Gold today, what would that be? I mean, I think really what I do is, is pull it back to a lot of the comments that, that I just made. I mean, if you if you think about the asset, I mean, it's, it's in a fantastic jurisdiction. The infrastructure is in place. We're just shy of 5 million ounces. The project economics are actually very good, uh, which is pretty rare. There's room for growth here. I mean, the project is, there's the upside is significant. Uh, it's unencumbered. I mean, there's no debt. We don't have any streams on the project. We still don't, there's no strategic investment there either. How many projects are like that in North America? I mean, at best, it's a handful. Uh, they are just very rare. And that I think Thesis is very well positioned to continue the re-rate that we're on because, I mean, relative to our peer group, I think we're still undervalued. So I think all of those com things combined really set us apart from everybody else. You said something there, no debt. No, no debt. Ah. Yep, no converters or anything. It's just 
very that, clean, that alone very simple story. that alone puts you in a category you know very small category of companies because i mean even some of the biggest companies in the world have some debt so great to see that you guys are doing the right things to build your balance sheet and that's extremely important for for me and for our community of investors now what is the best way for someone that's watching this that's maybe hearing about you for the first time to get in touch with the company if they have any questions or if they're interested in getting involved either in a private placement or in some capacity what's the best way for them to get in contact with you i think you can just reach out to us on any of the social media platforms you can go to our website and sign up to the mailing list you can either email myself or dave our corporate development investor relations at at Dave B at thesisgold.com and uh, e either of us will get back to you straight away. Fantastic. We are speaking with Ewan Webster, the CEO of Thesis Gold. The symbol in Canada is TAU. The symbol in America is THSGF. And they're also listed in Frankfurt, Germany under the symbol A3EP87. Thank you for joining us, Ewan. We'd love to have you back on the show again. Is there anything else you want to say before we say goodbye today? I uh, know that's perfect. Thanks, Rich. Really appreciate your time today. And thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, stay tuned for more updates over the coming months. Ewan Webster, the CEO of Thesis Gold. Ewan, keep up the great work, and we'll see you again soon.